kind of week tonight. We come to have some church. Let's do it again. Now come on and make some noise in this house. There you go. Hey guys, I'm Pastor Daniel Owens, the Outreach Pastor here at Light Springs Church. Hey, welcome here. If this is your first time here, sit back, relax. Scan the barcode on the, uh, on the, on, you know, well, somewhere. Um, scan the barcode, and um, we have a free gift for you in our guest services area because we want to connect with you, so make sure you stop by there. If you have to use the restroom or anything, if you go out the doors, the center doors to the left, down the hallway to the left, you have the men and women restrooms. We also have different other atmosphere because we're recording services for all over the world and even in different places and rehabs and stuff. So we like to keep this area a little quieter and stiller. So if you don't want to take advantage of our wonderful kids ministry, we have the party room, we have the lounge, we have different other environments so we can make sure you hear the word wherever you are on this campus. All right, let's get ready to praise the Lord. Now listen, what you put in is Oh, Jesus. What you put in is Anybody need something from the Lord? You're in the right place at the right time to receive a blessing from the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for allowing us to see another day that you have made. Now, God, I pray, God, that those that are in this room, God, leave out of here different than they came. Recharge us. Revive us, God. Give us strength to go through another week and know that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. Accept our worship as we worship you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, clap your hands, give God praise, and let's worship Jesus.
Give God a hand clap of praise. Can we show him some gratitude today? God is so good. God is so good. Hey, my name is Shane. I'm the campus pastor here at the Sanford location. I'm honored that you're here in, in person, but I'm also honored that you're watching online. And I just want to share just a couple minutes of word with you. You know, we just sang that song, Gratitude. And gratitude is probably not a word you use much today or this week. But the definition of gratitude means, it says, it is the quality of being thankful. Now, I don't know about y'all, but the Bible tells us that words have power. It says that life and death is in the power of the tongue. And so it made me think of years ago, many years ago, I was doing some things that I shouldn't have been doing. I was drinking some things I shouldn't have been drinking. I was smoking some things I shouldn't have been smoking. And the next thing I knew, I was in the hospital. I was in the ER. And I can remember laying in that bed thinking, God, if you just save me, if you just help me, if you take care of me, Lord, I'll give my life to you. I'll follow you all the days of my life. I'll serve you forever. But I was only fooling myself. 
because the Lord knew my heart. He knew that those words I was speaking, they didn't have any weight to them. What I was doing, I was hoping the Lord was going to take me out of that current situation by what I was saying. But thank the Lord, several years later, I got to come to an altar right here at Life Springs Church. I got to say those same words, got to say those same words again, and they had a different meaning. And the Lord met me right here at this altar. And you know what happened was, I thought, back then when I was in that ER, God was going to get me out of that current situation. And when I made that commitment right here at this altar, he not only got me out of that current situation I was in, but he also preserved a future position for me in heaven. And I'm so grateful for that. I, that is my gratitude to God that he saved me. And some of the most powerful words that's ever been spoken, Jesus said right before he was crucified, he said, Father, forgive them for they know what they do. There's been no more powerful words than that. That we can call on Jesus Christ to save our soul. And I'll tell you what, there may be folks here watching, there may be people in this room that are like, I, I don't know what to say. I don't have any words. I can't pray. I can't even do anything but cry. But let me tell you, the Bible also says in Romans 8, he said the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit intercedes for the wordless groans that we give. So I want to pray with you right quick. Father, we praise you and we thank you, God. We thank you. We have a gratitude for you. And Father, I do believe that there are people watching online or there are people in this room that they don't even know what to say. They're in a spot that they never thought they would ever be in. And all they can do is cry out to you. And the great news is, just like I said in Romans 8, your Holy Spirit intercedes for those wordless groans. You hear their cry. You hear their pleas. And Father, I pray right now for the one that is crying out to you that they would give their heart to you. That all those weightless words that they've been saying all these years, that today these words that they say would have some weight to it. It would be speaking life, not death. And I pray, Father, that they would just say, God, I love you. I ask you to forgive me. I believe that your son died on a cross, and three days later he rose again. And from this day forth, I'm going to serve you till the rest of my life. I'm not going to be perfect, but I'm going to serve you, and I'm going to recognize you as Lord. And I'm going to give up the CEO of this world and give it to you. And, Father, we give you the glory and we give you the praise. And we ask in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Can we praise him one more time? God is so good. Amen, amen. If you would, high-five your neighbor. Don't be too hard on them. And then you can have a seat. Hey, everybody. Whether you are at any of our locations or watching online, we are so glad that you have come and joined us today. Welcome home. If you are attending the Sanford location, scan this QR code to get access to the internet. At Life Springs, we are passionate about helping you discover the love of Jesus, develop the character of Jesus, and deliver the message of Jesus. There are many ways that we seek to accomplish this goal, so let's take a look at some places to start. It all begins by connecting with people. God designed us for a relationship with Him and each other. We have a lot of opportunities for you to get connected. Here are just a few. To stay up to date with everything going on, text 411 to the number on the screen or go to lifesprings.online. If you're new here, we did not invite you here to take your money. We just want you to hear the greatest story ever told. In fact, if you scan this QR code and let us know that this is your first time, or if you haven't ever scanned this QR code before, Scan this now and we have a free gift just for you. If you're a part of our church family and call Life Springs Church your home, now is your opportunity to give. You can either give in person with giving envelopes, online at lifesprings.online, or through the Church Center app. Do you want to get involved or learn more about Life Springs Church? Then you should come to Growth Track. 
The Growth Track teaches you more about the mission, vision, values, and beliefs of LifeSprings. It creates opportunities for you to grow your faith, helps you learn about your next steps, and gets you connected with others. To learn more and sign up for the next Growth Track, scan this QR code or go to lifesprings.online. To stay connected throughout the week, make sure to follow us on social media through Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Thank you again for joining us today. As we prepare for today's message, be sure to text sermon or prayer to 919-586-8900 for sermon notes or for prayer. everybody, Jonathan here, and we have a special announcement for you. If you're a homeschool family, or maybe you've thought about being a homeschool family and you're not sure where to begin, we want to get you together for an information meeting on Tuesday, August 1st at 6.30 p.m. And we're just going to have a meeting and, and talk about what that's all about. So make sure you mark your calendars and more details will follow in the weeks to come. So now, check out this Sermon Bumper video. Hey guys, I'm Denny and I'm the Kids Ministry Leader Assistant here at the Sanford campus. You've probably seen me as you're checking your kids in and picking them up in the afternoon. One of the things I love here is being with the kids and being able to teach them about Jesus and helping them get to know Him. One of my favorite things is being here at church. I love being here. So just to tell you guys a little bit more about me. I am married and have two kids. One's three and one is one and a half, both boys, and they are crazy as they come. One more thing about me, I really love cats. I've got three of them. A gray one named Athena, a white one named Smudge, and a big black and brown one named Aries. They're just adorable and lovable, and yeah, I really love cats. Now that you know a little bit more about me, let's dive into the Word and learn some more about some of the characters in the Bible that are a little bit more unknown. Especially all of our friends in the uh, prison system and the jail system and the re uh, are in rehabilitation. I always want to give a shout out. What a great week this week. I, I got to be with some of you in the jail and and milestone as you've earned credits and job readiness and you're preparing for your future and we're so glad you're watching. I want to say hello to all of our friends in Johnson County and Harnett County and Lee County. We got a large church family. A lot of you traveling and couldn't be here today and so we want you to know we're still loving you and preparing for you and we're saving a seat for you. Come on, get loud with me. Let everybody know we're glad you're here. Amen. Glad you're here. Hey, uh, I want to just thank God for what he's doing. I'm on a couple of things about a, a video I want to talk about for just a second. One thing I want to talk about is how about Jenny? Come on. And she went public confessing she likes cats. <laughs> Most people won't do that, you know, and that's, that's amazing. And, I, I, you know, I, my favorite thing to tell Jenny, and I know I won't get an email about this. Uh, I, my favorite thing to tell Jenny is I like cats too. I really do. I just can't eat them one of them, like all of one in one setting. It's two or three meals for me. Oh. <laughs> I email a shame at LifeSpring.com. <laughs> tell me how much you hate it, and I thought I had that joke, you know. We appreciate it. Uh, other thing I'm going to comment about, about this, uh, about, and, and what we're doing during the series, I know we'll get to it in a few minutes, but not now. And so that's what uh, we're introducing our staff here in the series, the ones that you might not know. But how about that video with all those kids and dancing? And um, I, Pastor Chris is here in this service. I was told 165 kids between here and Western Harnett have registered for summer camp. Can we celebrate? Is that right? Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. Clap in a minute. What is it? Doesn't include all the walk-ins. Come on. So we've got close to 175 or so. Come on. Celebrate. Exactly. Amen. 
And while you're in the mood to clap, let's clap about this. Last, uh, this past week, I got a text on Wednesday evening that 13 teenagers made a commitment to Jesus Christ at youth group. Now that deserves, come on, go and clap off this class. Exciting stuff. Exciting stuff. So excited about that. Excited so much about that. This is a great summer. And we, we love our, you'll hear more about our summer camp and what's been going on, uh, I'm sure, in the weeks ahead. Another thing that's going to be happening is some of our kids are going to go to Crusader Youth Camp, which is very, very special to me. That's where I was uh, introduced to the Lord and where I was called to preach. It's where my dad was called to preach. And um, uh, it's where my son's been serving and he, he feels a call. It's a very, very special place to us. A lot of our kids go. Um, in fact, I want to give some of you an opportunity. Uh, some of our kids want to go. We've got one or two kids that want to go. It's about a $300 tuition. And um, they, their, their family's just at a spot right now that need to be sponsored. So if you'd like to sponsor a kid to go, uh, you can do that. Go to uh, our website, LifeStreams.online, or you could uh, place the check in the box and just write on it, C, uh, put CYC Sponsorship, or, or both put Camp Sponsorship, which we'll know what that means. And if we get more than what's needed this year, then we'll keep it for next year. But it's a great opportunity to be able to bless a child. And so uh, just, just something to think about uh, as you do. Another thing I want to say before I get into the message is um, uh, in July, I the church has been so gracious to me for about eight or ten years now because we started having so many services and so many campuses and so much. Uh, they gave me what um, we used to call a sabbatical, but I don't really communicate. Actually, we called it a vacation to start out with, so I wouldn't do that, but then the sabbatical. But what, really what it is, it's a study break. Uh, it takes a lot out of you to study. Can you imagine, like, standing in front of hundreds of people every week and then staring at you, looking at you in the face, saying, say something we ain't heard before, preacher. You know, right? And it is just hard. In fact, they say, they say I don't know if I believe this or not, but they say the number one fear that people have is to stand in front of people. Um, like, they just give it up. So they would rather, like, that's, that's like the greater fear than death. So you say that at a funeral, you'd rather be the guy in the coffin than the guy preaching? That's the problem. But anyway, uh, this is, this is it, it becomes a, a trouble every week, and it wears you down spiritually. So the, the church has given me um, a, 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 the month of July as a study break. And so I'm going to take the study break in July, and our outstanding preaching team is going to be carrying it. And I'll still be doing some work and doing some things, but, but we'll have the burden of having to study and prepare and all that for sermons uh, during that time because there's so many sermons. But here's what I want you to do. Uh, there's a graphic right now that's on here. Um, when I come back, I'm going to start a series, and I'm gonna, it's going to be called Asking for a Friend. So go ahead and put that graphic up. Asking for a friend. Say, asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. That was really weak. All right, asking for a friend. Asking for a friend. So here's what I want you to do. If you have a question that you have always wanted to ask a preacher, now I'm not guaranteeing I'm going to answer all these questions, okay? Let me say that up front. But if you have a question you would always want to ask, like, um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, like whatever, about divorce and remarriage or about, uh, you know, sexuality or homosexuality, whatever. If there's a question that you would like to answer, have an answer to or angels and demons or if you'd like to have a, uh, a, the second coming of Christ or anything like that, if you ever wanted to ask a question, this is your opportunity. Now, you can do it anonymously because I know some of you's got questions that you do not want to put your name to. So you might not want to scan the QR code, but you can write it on a prayer card and see back in front of you and place it in the black box on your way out. And you can write it for the whole month of July. And when I get back in August, we're going to start that series. And I'm not promising to take on all of your questions, but uh, but I might. Does that make sense? And so say yes? Yes. All right. So that's all I got. Now, today i got to get in this message. I'm already running a little bit behind. To the series we're in right now is called Ready? One, two, three, call. Unknown, and we're talking about taking your place, and what we're doing is we're going through the scriptures, and we're looking at people that uh, might not get a lot of airtime. There's a lot of guys that we that you hear a lot about the Bible, like you hear about the disciples, and you hear, you know, Peter, James, John, Matthew, all those. You hear about like Moses and Joshua and Nehemiah, and different, but but there's other people that are a little more obscure that you probably hadn't heard about. But this is my thinking: is if they made their place in the Bible, then we ought to at least mention it. Come on, right? If your name was in the Bible, how do you feel like you did something? Oh, damn, that's good height, right? Now, some of you have got a Bible name, but you didn't earn that name. You were given that name, right? But, but, but your name was in the Bible, then you feel like that you, you've done something. So I want to talk about them. And uh, some of them are bad examples. And we learned, we looked at that last week, and we looked at uh, ways, you know, of what not to do. And so we looked at, anybody remember, who did we talk about last week? We talked about who, remember? Lot. That's right. We talked about Lot and a um, very dysfunctional family. And I made a statement last week. I said that every family is dysfunctional just at different levels. Isn't that right? 
Some people have a lot of dysfunction, some have a little bit of dysfunction, but let me tell you what I know about your family. Every family as referenced in this place is dysfunctional at some level. Let me tell you why I know that. Because there ain't nobody perfect. And if it was perfect people, we'd have perfect families. Would all the perfect people raise your hand because we would like to tell you why you're not perfect. We would love to do that right now, right? All the imperfect people raise your hand. Hold your hand up right. That's who we are. And so because of that, we all have family dysfunction and family things that go on. And today, what I want to talk about, because it comes on the heels of last week, as I've talked about a lot and talked about how not to go that way, uh, today I want to talk about, in this message, about how to break, if, you, if you're from a dysfunctional family, and let's see if you're listening, if, if you're from a dysfunctional family, if you're from a family that has dysfunction in it, raise your hand. To see who's listening. Come on. Oh, yeah. All right. If you're from a family that has any dysfunction, I want to talk to you today about how to break those, um, those traditions, those patterns. We're going to call them generational curses almost that, that come down. And here's what I want to let you know in case you don't know this. Change starts with me. Here's what I want to let you know. This is the whole sermon kind of here in case you don't know this. And some of you are going to kick back on the statement, but it is a truth whether you like it or not. Here it is. Ready? Your childhood, here's your life stream short social media moment. Your childhood is. Circle is, say is. 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 Somebody didn't like what I was preaching. <laughs> <laughs> your childhood is, say is. Is. Is impacting your adulthood. That is true. Your childhood is impacting your adulthood. Thank you. That was good. Give Van a hand. I mean, I'm telling you a hand, brother. That's good. Your childhood, what? Is. Yes. Is. Whether you like it or not, whether you know it or not, whether you knew it or not, it, that your childhood is impacting your adulthood. Um, now, uh, that could be good and that could be bad. Let me see. I'm going to see. I'm going to date myself right here. And I'm going to check the audience right here and see where you are. Okay. See if you know who this is. So don't ask me, Hank, why do you? Why do you? Bunch of heathens. <laughs> All right. I'm not good now. I can take this down. All right. We're going to lay this over here, right here. Why must you live out the songs that you wrote? Right? Is that what he said? Yep. Stop and think it over. What is the next one? Yeah. Listen, he didn't come to church here. <laughs> Try to put yourself in my unique position. Now, here it is. If you really know. If I get and drink all night long, it's a family Look at the person beside him and say, you needed to be in church. Go ahead and do it. You need to be in church. And some of you are like, what in the world are they talking about? We dated ourselves. We, we know, I know that we did. But here's what he's saying. And Hank William Jr. had some family traditions. Now, some of you is like, some of you, some of you think your family's bad. I think he might, he might have had some family traditions to break free from as well. But here's the deal. Maybe your family is not as bad as what he came from. Maybe your family's a little better. Maybe, maybe your family makes his family look like a bunch of Sunday school teachers. I don't know. But what we all have is family traditions that go on our family, and it affects us, and we have to break free from that. And some of it's simple, silly kind of things. Uh, my mama would always cut her pot roast in half. And somebody asked her, said, why do you always cut your pot roast? She said, well, my mom, my mom always did it. It makes it really moist. And so her and her sister got to talking about it and said, we, you know, they both cut their pot roast in half. And they, they said, they come make your pot roast really good and moist. And so we, they got to uh, my grandmother's house. We called her Mamma. They said, Mamma, why, why do we tell it? We, somebody's asked us, why do we cut our pot roast in half? How does it work? Why does it make it moist to cut it in half? And, and Mamma said, I don't know. So well, why do you cut it in half? She said, I cut it in half because my pan wasn't big enough for a whole pot roast. <laughs> So for 30 years, they've been cutting the pot roast in half, and it had nothing to do with anything that they thought it had to do with, because this is what happens. It is, your childhood is impacting your adulthood. I have a picture right here that I want to show you. This is a picture I posted on Father's Day, and it's at Crusader Youth Camp, the camp that I was just talking about that we were at. My dad was a director of that camp, 
And um, in the top of that gazebo is a bell, and it was at another campground, same camp, but a different location. And, and he got saved and, uh, at church, but he got called to preach at that camp, and then he got into ministry, and then he, he became a director and moved that bell and built that gazebo at this new camp that he's at. That's the camp I was saved at and sanctified and called to preach. That's where I was called to preach at. And now my son, he's been there working all week. And he's there, and he's built a call into the ministry, and it was right there at that camp. And he's holding my grandbaby. If you want to know what angels look like, just look closely. You can zoom in, and you'll know exactly what angels look like. Who knows what's going to happen there? And here's the thing. It's, it, it, it comes on family tradition. Now, here's the, here's the great thing. In that line right there, there's some really, really good things that I've got from my dad. I've learned people skills from my dad. I've learned leadership skills from my dad. I've learned business sense from my dad. But I've learned a lot of things from my dad that aren't good. In fact, you don't believe it. Watch us at a buffet. <laughs> you watch us at watch us in our workout schedules. We got some other things that are too personal for me to stand here and talk about and put all over the world. But we've got things in our family that I've also got from him that were not good. You can go ahead and put up the next slide. That I want to remind you again, your childhood, say it with me. Your childhood is impacting your adulthood. Everybody got trained as a child, and it shows up in your adulthood. Some of them were good, and you received the blessing from it. You learned your people skills, and now you're a good salesman. You learned your management skills, and now you're a good businessman. You learned it. But there's also some things that are not so much that you wish you had to learn, and you're trying to unlearn. Can anybody follow what I'm saying? And so let me hear an amen right now. And here's what happened. Before long, before you know it, you'll start repeating history. You know you're acting just like your grandmother, your grandfather, your mom, your dad, your uncle. You know you're just acting just like that side of the family. Ever what that looks like. It may, instead of listening, you're yelling. Instead of loving, you're rejecting. Instead of being patient, you're exploding. You know, you know you're, you're saying to yourself, my goodness, this is 1995 all over again. Like, I'm repeating my parents' life, and where is this coming from? And I don't want to be like this. And here's what I'm saying. We, can, we don't have to be held captive to that. No matter how, it, it's, it, not all of it is as simple as cutting a pop roast. Some of it is the smoking and the drinking and the temper and the aloof and the disconnecting emotionally. And we're going to talk about how to break that. But I want you to know, today, I'm going to give you, in just a second, three disciplines. Say disciplines. disciplines. Say, you're, you're being weak. Three what? Three disciplines. They are not steps. So do not come up to me after the service and say, I tried those three steps. Don't come up to me in a week from now and say, I tried those three steps. They didn't work. That's, that, these are not steps. They are what? What did I say? They are disciplines. disciplines. That's like saying to me, I can't. That's like saying, hey, I worked out last week and I'm still not, I'm still not in shape. It's not work like that. It's like coming up to me and saying, hey, I, I tried to eat good for a whole month and I'm still not there. It doesn't work like that. It's a discipline. It has to get into your lifestyle. I had an imagery prepared for this message. Um, you ever, who's ever seen one of those escalators where, like, you don't have to actually walk. You can just ride it down. Y'all seen that, right? Now, have you ever seen anybody with an escalator going down, and they decided to be funny? Most of the time, it's kids that do this, and they try to go up an escalator that's going down. But just by a show of hands, who's ever tried that? Hold your hands up. Okay, I thought that's okay. <laughs> now, you can do it. You can do it. I've seen people do it. I've never tried because I'm too lazy, but I've seen people do it. You can do it. But what you have to do is you have to, you have to stay moving, you have to stay active, you have to stay pressing because everything in that escalator is pushing you down. And the moment you stop moving, the moment you stop stepping, the moment you stop climbing, then what happens? Here's what I want you to know. Your childhood, in a very real sense, has, in good ways and bad ways, has an anchor tied to you. And if you're going to become free from something, you cannot, you cannot stop stepping. Who's got it? If you got it, say got it. Got it. You, you're going to have to stop this decline. And maybe it's not even in your family. Maybe it's a change in you. And I want you to know everything in our society is headed south. You're going to have to keep it moving. Okay. Uh, with that being said, let me get into the one I want to talk about today. Now, uh, I, this is one of the obscure people, so I always feel like I need to talk on this. Uh, today I want to talk about uh, King Josiah. 
Now, the reason I want to talk about that, and some of you are not there, uh, you, you're getting a little bit ahead. I'm going to back up just a little bit. Yeah, I want to talk about King Josiah, and, and the reason that's important is because we named our firstborn Josiah, and now there's several Josiahs. I'm just curious, how many of you know a Josiah other than my son? Hold your hands up good high. All right, we knew none of them whenever we named Josiah Josiah. And so we had to, I had to explain his name to a lot of people. So I'm going to, he's one of my favorite characters in the Bible, and you're going to understand why today uh, as we go through that. Now, King Josiah was from two generations of terrible parenting. I'm talking horrible parenting. He had a lousy, a lousy, lousy grandfather and an awful, awful daddy, terrible, and he broke the pattern. He broke the chains that held him captive. He did that. Now, today I'm going to tell you why. Let me, let me back up and tell you about his dad, his granddad. His granddad was King Manasseh, and uh, he, he was so bad that his intent, his his whole goal, King Manasseh, his, Josiah's granddad, was to rid Jerusalem of anything that had to do with the Jewish God. He, he took away, um, he tried to eradicate God's law. If he found a Bible or the law, he tore it up and broke it up, the Mosaic law. He put in, he took the temple and put idols inside of the temple. And he put, um, he killed all the Bible-believing priests, all the preachers, he killed them. He just, he killed them. And um, he did more, he was a Jewish man, but he did more to destroy Judaism than anybody could have ever done from the outside. Well, then his son, King Ammon, he came behind him and he wasn't any better. In fact, he was worse. And he followed right into his daddy's footsteps. He worshipped all those foreign gods in the temple. He set up more idols in the temple. And, and he did nothing to reestablish Jerusalem and the temple and all that in Judaism. He did nothing to, to reestablish that. In fact, uh, Ammon was so bad that his staff even... They plotted to kill him, and they did kill him, and the guys that did the coup were going to take over the kingdom, and then another coup rose up and killed the ones that were doing the coup, and then they got killed, and it's just chaos. It's just total chaos, and in the middle of all that, King Josiah steps up after they kill his dad, and he becomes king. Now watch this. King Josiah became king at eight years old. And he took a kingdom that's killing each other and divided. Eight years old. Most eight-year-olds have their finger up their nose. Right? And this guy has become king at eight years old. Now, I often say that Josiah became king at eight days old because that's about we had we sat and stayed in the hospital a little longer. And that's when we brought him home and he thought he was king of the house. We had to, we had to teach him. But anyway, he became king at eight years old. And, and he becomes king, and they crown him. The whole culture is bad. He can't find a copy of the Bible nowhere because his granddaddy's killed all that. He can't find a priest. Okay? He's killed all them. Chaos is in the land. They're killing each other. And he turns the whole thing around. And I love it because Josiah is a young leader who broke the pattern in his family and began to take things in a whole different direction. Okay, so that's where we'll pick up. I'm going to give you three disciplines. Say disciplines. Come on, say disciplines. All right, three disciplines to break a generation curse. Number one, first discipline I want to say, you're going to have to choose new role models. We're going to see that right now from him. We're going to have to choose new role models. Say that with me. Choose new role models. Here we go, 2 Chronicles 34, verses 1 through 3. Josiah was eight years old when he became king, and he, ran in, and he reigned in Jerusalem for 31 years. So he reigned until he was about 39 years old. He did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight. And notice this next line. He followed the example of his ancestor, who? And he did not turn away from doing what was right. Now, Josiah realized that evidently he could not take his cue from his dad or his granddad. And so he went back to King, who? To his ancestor, who? King that was, so those that don't know, that was over 300 years before he was born. He went back in his family tree. I don't even, I, I don't, I don't even know how you would do that, right? They kept good records. I mean, that poor Ancestry.com. He went back 300 years. Now, not everybody had that writing, but King David was so popular, he was in every history book. Even though his granddad had destroyed all the Bible, King David was the big Jew. I mean, he, was, he had it. He, had it every, he was in every book. He went back 
300 plus years to find someone that he could model his life after. And he went and studied and read about King David. And evidently he learned that God blessed his leadership and God gave him favor. And he, he, his country won, his economy was good. And so he went and found King David 300 plus years and began to model himself after him. Verse 3, during the eighth year of his reign, which he's about, seven, he's about 16 years old at the time, while he was still young, 16 years old roughly, Josiah began to speak, uh, began to seek the Lord of his ancestor David. This is a man who skipped the generations in front of him and went all the way back and found a person that he could pattern himself after. Now I'm going to say something before I move on to the second discipline. Some of you need to find some new role models. Some of you um, need to get close enough to somebody to see it lived out in front of you. You've never seen it lived out in front of you. you you've never seen someone treat a spouse. You don't know how to treat a spouse. You've never known a family that don't argue and moody and slam doors and do whatever. You don't know, you don't know how to behave. You, you were never taught how to behave. You were never disciplined how to behave. You, you don't know how to handle money. You no one's ever taught you how to handle money. You don't, know, you don't know how to do that. You don't know how to cope with stress because your mom just, more wine at the end of the week. Is more, I mean, that's all she ever did. You don't know how to do that. You need a new vision. You need a new role model. You might, you might, you might want to say, you know, that, that, that there really can be a marriage that's healthy because you've never seen that before. That, you know, there, there really can be people who differ and can act sane about it. You know, there, there really can. I don't have to quit whenever we have a conflict. I can actually work through a conflict and make it. Like a, it's possible to live on a budget and be a tither and give 10% of my income to God. Like, you've never had that model. You don't know how to do that. It's a powerful thing. See, this is where a lot of you are. I've been in ministry for a long time. And a lot of you think you're breaking the chain. You're breaking the, the pattern in your family. And here's the reason why you think you're breaking it. The reason you think you're breaking it is because here's what you'll say. You'll say, I don't need any role, good role models because I've had so many bad role models. I know what I don't want to be. Let me tell you what I know about this. When you focus on what you don't want to be, you will become the thing you don't want to be. Let me illustrate it to you this way. When you were growing up, did you hang up posters in your room? Let me ask you another question. Did you hang up posters of bad athletes and ugly models? No. You put up posters in your room with people you wanted to be like. Not people you didn't want to be like. Because it kept your mind on the go. Here's what I want to tell you. Some of you, you've got posters up in your mind. And it's the posters from your childhood. And every decision you make is, I just don't want to be like them. I just don't want to be like them. I just want to be like them. You need to take down those posters. And it's time for you to put up a new poster. Now, does that mean you don't love that person? No. Like I said, I learned so many great things from my dad that are incredible. My mom, and they're awesome. And I don't want to go through and air all my family's laundry and all that thing. But my daddy, my mom would be the first one to tell you if they stood on the stage. Hey, when it comes to like the way we manage our physical health, take that poster down, okay? And let's put up a different poster on the wall. Who's understanding what I'm saying? Hold your hands up good high. You need to find a better role model in that area. Does not mean your parents are terrible. Does not mean your grandparents are terrible. Does not mean your whole family's terrible. It means you want something better for your next for the next generation. I, I was hoping to get more amens. I'm feeling a little bit alone up here. Can I? Are y'all believing what I'm saying? Do you agree? If so, let me hear an amen right now if you believe that. So, so here's what I want to say for you. Move on. If this is where, you, where I go to the next point, what I want you to do is two things. I want you to pray. First of all, I want you to pray that God would bring somebody into your life. Say, God, bring somebody in my life who's making it work. I, I've never seen this area work. And, and, and I, I want to, if, if I'm not, if I don't have somebody to give me a different role model, on how to handle stress or how to handle alcohol or how to handle my weight or how to handle things, then I'm going to recreate what I've always been told. So pray. And then the second thing is I want you to get out and start building relationships. Like, especially spiritually. That's another reason I'm a small group. We'll have a group sign up in two weeks. Sign up for a small group. And just start getting to know people. Join a ministry team and start. I'm telling you, there's some good people that go to church. Can I hear an amen to that, right? Just get to know them and just get around them and just start seeing different dynamics. Let me tell you the young people. Let me tell you what we've had. I've seen this in my family, my, my parents' house, but we've also seen it in our house. Um, we, we, 
if you find a family that like say you know maybe your family was not exactly what you want to recreate but you found this family that you know like man, that's, that's really great then why don't you start like hanging out with them somehow so well, how do you hang out with them volunteer to babysit or if they're doing something we, we had this young lady one time we had several kids do this through the years um in our family my personal family but one day we were doing some yard work and this young girl called my wife and she said can i come and help y'all do yard work and melissa was like uh yeah but why you know because most kids you're like do yard work you know right so so this young lady came out and we were sweating we were moving in the yard we were working and i asked her i, I it was just she and i were there, like working from side to side everybody was placed in the yard i said i'm curious why would you come over here today to do yard work she was what she told me she said, because I'm from a very dysfunctional family and you're the most put together family I know. And I don't want to recreate the dysfunction in my, in my, in my family. And I wanted to come over here and I'm just looking at every opportunity I can to be with y'all. Okay, that is a young lady who knows what it's like to break a chain. Amen. You got it? You got it? Say got it. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. That's what Josiah did. He, he, he got a clear picture, a new role model. You got to be intentional. Second thing I want to say, ready? First thing I want to say is you need new role models. Second thing I want to say, this is a discipline. Say discipline is purify your world. Pure, choose new role models. Second, purify your world. Say purify your world. Purify your world. All right. Josiah purified himself, uh, purified from himself anything that had the potential of dragging him back to what his dad and his granddad taught him. Second Chronicles 34, uh, verse uh, 3. Then in the last part of verse 3. Then in the 12th year, he began to purify Judah and Jerusalem, destroying all the pagan shrines and the Asherah poles and carved idols and cast images. He ordered that the altars of Baal be demolished and that the incense altars which stood above them be broken down. He also made sure that the Asherah poles, the carved idols, and the cast images were smashed and scattered over the graves of those who had been sacrificed there. Now notice this next part, verse 5. He burned the bones of the pagan priests on their own altars. And so he purified, say he purified, purified. Judah and Jerusalem. I, whenever um, we were in the hospital having Josiah, my father-in-law he came to visit and was like waiting on the baby. And he said he, he had heard that we were naming Josiah. He he, he was we didn't him along. He said, "Help me! What what's that name? Joe? Joseph?" I said, "No, it's Josiah." He said, "Where did you get it from?" I said, "I got it from the Bible." He said, "I've never heard of him in the Bible. I've been in Sunday school all my life in church. Never heard anybody preach on." I said, "No." I said, let me read it. I read this part and I got to verse 5. He burned the bones. I, I'm excited. I'm angry. He burned the bones of the pagan priest and on their altars. And my father-in-law said, are, 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 you, are you sure you want to name him Josiah? <laughs> Sounds a little violent right here, right? And it just goes on verse after verse after verse about that. Here's a man who is tenaciously committed to getting rid of anything that hints of the past. I mean, he's like, anything that has the potential to take him back, anything that has the potential to, to, to lock him down, he says, I'm getting rid of that, I'm going away. And he, he, the Bible says he ground up the bones of the old priest. And, and, and I bet these guys are like, they're grinding up bones. They're like, why are we grinding up bones of dead people? They're dead. They're not going to be more dead after we grind their bones than they are right now. He's sending a message. He sent the message and he said, I'm serious about this. We ain't going back. We're not going back. He took extreme measures. Why? Because he knew it was an extreme situation. He was, took extreme measures because he knew the chains that held. When it comes to your childhood, they're, they're tough. That's right. They're tough to break. Who's, who's tracking with me? Can I hear an amen right now? And extreme things has to, you have to have extreme situations. And I want to say, before I move on, you know what I'm going to say is challenging, but some of us, you need to purify your world. You need to purify your playlist. You need to pur purify your library. You need to purify your home, your closet. You're keeping some memorabilia. How many books that you've kept? Your attic, 
You need to purify your computers. Um, you need to purify your social media. And just this past week, I, I deleted apps off my phone. Just because they, take, they, take, they were taken back. Things that have the potential to drag us back into relational dysfunction, into a lifestyle, into a world that you don't, you, you're trying very hard to break free. For, in point number one, I told you that there's some relationships you need to form. I told you that you need to go like join a small group and join a serve team and go, like if you're young, go identify with a family and, and get there. Okay, if, here you go. Just like I said in point number one, you need to form some relationships. Watch this. In point number two, talk about purifying your world. Some of you need to end some relationships. Um, ladies, you're running with a group of ladies that are extremely critical of their husbands. They never say anything good about their husbands. And your mom never said anything good about your dad. And you're wondering what's wrong with your marriage. I might have a clue. Men, you're running with guys who treat women like an object. And they're always saying crude things and sexual things. And your dad did the same thing. If he even stepped out, you think, on your mom. And you're on that path, man. You need to cut some relationships. Um, maybe you're from a family that's extremely negative, and it's like they're just they're negative. They're just negative about everything. And you find yourself, every workplace you go to, every church, you, you get with negative people. It's like you just gravitate to them. You, you need to put up some guardrails, some boundaries there. Maybe you have an addictive behavior, and you're trying to be free from it, but your friends drink. And they're not bad people, but they're bad for you. Because it has the potential because you're from a family of addicts. And alcohol is just something y'all love. And it's, you know, it's the whole Hank Williams Jr. thing. And you, you're, needing to, you're needing to cut that tie and break that. I, I could go on and on and on and on. You're, you're, you're a very materialistic person. And you're, all your friends are materialistic. And y'all do the retail therapy. But you can't afford it. And you can't live on a budget, and you, you're financially irresponsible, and, and, and it's okay to go have fun and, and shop, but, but you don't have it. You're trying to keep up, and you don't have that good thing. You need to purify your world. Things that are taken, watch that. Here's another one. You grew up in a home where your mom and your dad were distracted. They didn't have social media. They didn't have things. They were distracted. They were distracted by work. They were distracted by golf. They were distracted by hunt. They were distracted by whatever. And now you're, you're like, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to be like them. I'm but you sit there the whole time on your phone and you're in the room, but you're emotionally distracted. Detached. You're, you're repeating the same pattern. It's just a different thing that you're doing. So maybe you need to, maybe you do need to cut up some credit cards. I don't know, but here's what I do know. If you're going to purify your world, you probably, maybe you burn some old CDs. I, I don't know. I, I don't mean like bank CDs. I mean like they used to make these. Anyway, I don't have time. <laughs> I'm just saying you have to go to extremes because the power is so strong to bring you back into it. Who you understand? Close your hands with me. Okay. So number one, let's repeat. Go ahead and show the next slide. Let's go. Number one, choose the right, the new role models. Choose new role models. Second, purify your world. Now here's the third one. Ready? Establish scripture as the standard. Let's say all three of them together. Ready? One, two, three. Choose new role models. Number two, purify your world. Number three, establish scripture as the standard. Now these are not steps. They are what? These are things you do. You're, you're going to have to keep stepping. Or, or that or that escalator taking you down. Okay, that's that's it. All right. Josiah decided that scripture was going to be his standard for behavior, not what he felt, not because he was king, but he said, I don't know what to do. I'm only eight years old. I'm only 16 years old. I'm on, I need some help outside of myself. Now you say, well, how did he establish scripture when his granddaddy uh, burned it all and got rid of it? Well, that's a great story. Let me tell you what happened. When he read about David, he realized that the temple was centered for worship uh, in society for David and so uh, for their social and for their worship and everything else so he said to his men go clean out the temple and so his men are over there cleaning out the temple and while they're in the temple Lord behold they found a copy of the law uh, that his granddaddy didn't know existed and he would have destroyed it but I'm just telling you that's a sermon on his own I ain't got time you can't stomp out the word of God 
They found a copy of the law and they brought it to Josiah. He didn't know what it was, but he recognized what it was. And then he, here's what he did in verse 30, uh, verse 30 of chapter 34. And when the king went up, he, he said, he, well, what he did is he told everybody, he said, get everybody at the temple, get everybody there. He recognized the word, the word of God. And when the king went up to the temple of the Lord, when all the people of Judah and Jerusalem, along with the priests and the Levites, so he gathered everybody there, all the people from the greatest to the least, everybody, say everybody. The king read to them. Y'all think my sermons are bored. Can you imagine this? The king read to them the entire book of the covenant. You think my sermons are long? That's a long journey. That had been found in the Lord's temple. Now notice verse 31. I love this verse. The king took his place of authority. Now he, 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 he stood there beside the pillar. He took his place of authority. Like, I'm your king. Everybody know that. I'm standing here. I'm your king. And then what did he do? All this authority. Well, he took that authority. He renewed the covenant in God's presence. And this king, who took his place of authority, came under the law. He pledged to obey the law by keeping all his commands, laws, and decrees with all of his heart and soul. He promised to obey all the terms of the covenant that were written in the scroll. Listen. The curses in your life are only going to be broken by the Word of God. The power of God and the obedience to the Word of God. It's the Word and the deed. Because here's why. I can excuse almost any behavior, but I can say, well, you know, I, uh, I can excuse almost any behavior based on the circumstances. Well, of course I'm being mad. Of course I've got a temper. Have you tried to live with her? Of course I've got to yell at these kids. Have you tried to get these kids to do what they're trying to do? They're idiots. They act just like they're daddy. Of course I've got to eat all these Debbie cakes. I'm stressed. Of course I've got to drink all this. I've got things going on. I mean, of course this is a thing. I can excuse almost any behavior based on my circumstances. But what Josiah said, he said, I'm not going to allow my personality. I'm not going to allow my family tradition. I'm not going to allow the fact that I'm king to be the standard in me and this nation. God's word will be the standard. As for me and my house and all of us, we're going to serve the Lord. Yeah. And I'm not going to try to change the Bible. I'm not going to try to read the Bible and make it a fit to my lifestyle. I'm going to judge my behavior by the Bible, not judge the Bible by what I want my behavior to be. Amen. Y'all understand the difference of that? You see, the destructive patterns in your life are only going to be broken, I said it earlier, by the power of God's word and obedience to his word. Word and deed. So I'm going to give you a practical way. We're going to do that every time on every one of these points. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to find the issue that you struggle with. Maybe you tend to be deceitful. You're a little sneaky. You call them white lies. Uh, maybe you've got a little temper going on for you. Maybe you're a runner. Going gets tough and you just bail. Maybe you're moody. And everybody knows that mama ain't happy. Nobody happy. Maybe you are a little greedy. Maybe you're a little entitled. You feel like that you've kind of never got your fair shake in this world. And so you're always kind of feeling like, you know, I'm going to get a little extra. You know, I've had to grow up hard. Maybe you got some moodiness going on. I, I don't know. He said, well, I don't know what my issue is. Well, ask your wife and you young if they already know. They'll be back to you. They'll be back to you. He said, well, I ain't got no issues. If you, if, just by the show of hands, how many of you say, I got issues? Hold your hands up there tonight. If, you got, if, you, if you're not raising your hand, you say, well, I ain't got no issues. Well, that is your issue. That you think you ain't got no issues. That's your issue. Okay. Now, when you find your issue, I want you to go, and this is a Bible study, go find a Bible verse that speaks directly to your issue. And then what I want you to do is memorize. I'm a big proponent of scripture memorization. I, in every small group we've ever had in the beginning of this time, I've, I've tried to encourage our church to memorize scripture because the Bible says when you've hidden, hidden the word of God in your heart, you might not sin against him. And I'm a big proponent in the power of the word of God. I, I, I believe in scripture memorization. I, it's all through the Bible. I can, I can prove it to you biblically. It's not just a little nice little discipline. It is a biblical mandate to memorize scripture. Commit that scripture to memory. You say, well, it's hard. 
Well, you can remember who won the Super Bowl in 1973. Don't give me a tart. You can remember, you remember, you know, you remember a lot of things you shouldn't. If I spit out my social security number, you remember that probably, you know, right? You can remember things. You can remember things. Commit that to memory. And then what I've learned is when you're tempted to blow your stack, when you're tempted to be deceitful, the Holy Spirit, the incredible Holy Spirit, has a way of surfacing that verse back. Amen. What that does, when that verse comes back, there's power in God's Word. Does anybody believe that? Can I hear an amen? amen? And so what happens is you find the power to exercise self-control. You know why? Because God's Word has power. And his word is more powerful. Now listen to what I'm getting ready to say because this is going to shock some of you. God's word is more powerful than your commitments. God's word is more powerful than your promises. God's word is more powerful than your intentions. God's word is more powerful than your willpower. That's the reason some of you have never broken the train chain because you're trying to do it based on your commitments and your willpower and your intentions and you keep going back into it. But I'm here to tell you, you need a power source outside of your willpower to help you break that chain. You're going to need the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. And he's an instrument of change when he brings this word. And then I want you to use his word to give you strength. What it does is it gives you bearing to step back and say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I don't have to say that. I want to say that. My daddy would have said that. I'm not going to say it. I don't have to respond this way. I don't have to run away. I don't have to hide. I don't have to lose my temper. I don't have to watch that channel. I don't have to click on that link. I don't have to do that. Because I have God's word. The Bible says that is the only offensive weapon in Ephesians 6 for spiritual warfare. Um, you have freedom, not by your commitments, but the freedom from come by God's word. So here, here's, here's the passage about Josiah that I love. He framed it and put it on my son's wall all of his life. And this is what I want to say about me. Never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord now notice the language. You remember the commandment that God said the most important commandment was love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength, love your neighbor as yourself. Notice the language right here in the Old Testament. Who turned to the Lord with what? With all his heart, soul, and strength. Same language. Obeying all the laws of Moses, and there has never been a king like him since. All right, so here we go. Review. Let's go through the slide. Review. Choose New world life. You want to do, these are not habits. They're what? They are. They are what? You got to constantly be looking for new world lives. Constantly purify your world. Constantly establishing scripture as your standard. Who understands those three disciplines? Hold your hands up. If you do that, it's like a magic cure. So don't come up to me afterwards and say, I did that last week. It didn't happen. These chains that hold us, they're, they're tough. They're tough. And it starts with baby steps. You know, earlier this spring, I made a commitment that I'm gonna I'm gonna walk two miles about at least three times a week. It's a baby step. But I'm, I'm trying. I've been doing that for a few months, and, and I'm gonna you start with baby steps, but it's a discipline. Here's what I'm saying: I'm gonna start walking up the escalator, not just riding it down. Who understands what's going on? Yeah, this is new. I know. Let me show you. This is my ten finger prayer. I pray this a lot. Hold Go to the next slide. Ten frame. Hold up, ten frame. Everybody ready? Hold them up. Next slide. Ready? This is my ten frame of prayer. I pray this all the time. Nobody knows. I've been doing this for 30 some years. I see everybody's hands up. I need everybody's hands up, or we will never get out of here. Go ahead, ready? Okay. Read with me. One, two, three. And hold on. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Come on, keep them up. Let's go, everybody. Ready? One, two, three. I Come on again. Ready? How many of you believe that you're an amen right now? Here's the difference. Go ahead and give it my hand. It's not just you on your own. Like God wants you to break this pattern into this thing in your family and your life more than you do. And he's, a, he's in heaven root for you. He said, I'm going to give you freedom. Here's what I want to end 
I want to know, no head bow, every eye open, okay? I want to know in this room, how many of you already know maybe one or two things that you want to be free from? Anybody other than me? I got two or three things that I got. Go ahead, hold them up, hold them up. It's okay. You're not just honoring your parents. You know what? Your parents will probably say, you need to raise your hand. I'll give you some things. But I'll give my kids some things. They weren't for me. I want them to raise their hand, right? You're not just honoring. You're just being, I never want it. You want different. Hold it up. Good and high. Good and high. All right, self-inclusion. Now, here's what I want to do. I have some in the bowl right here. I got little pieces of change. Okay? I want you to take this piece of change. And just a second, I'm going to pray for it. I'm going to I want you to take it home and put it work. Get it on a bulletin board. Put it in a desk drawer. Put it in your pocket. I don't know. Put it somewhere. Put it in your car. Put it on a magnet or a refrigerator. I don't know. I want you to put it somewhere to remind you of this service that we're breaking today. That would be just Susan. You understand Who's willing to do that? Now, I don't, I don't want you to come get the change if you're not going to take it serious. But if you're going to take it serious, you just do it. In fact, if you want to do it, get your change just stand it all around. I'll come back at the end of it. Pray, pray now. And I'm going to release you. Everybody in the house, everybody wants to come get it. You can go back to the chair. You can stand here at the altar either way. And I want you to hold that change. I'm going to pray with you. Prayer. Father, as we come, as we come, as we sing, start stirring our hearts. Don't let us lose focus. Stay in the truth. I believe it's the spiritual moment, the power of God. Use it for your glory to break chains. Come on, somebody move. Let's go ahead and take all of the arms, several bowls. Let's go ahead and get them. Let's say the arms. Whatever. Everybody can rise. Let's take them by the wheel. Let's use it for that.
generation that needs to be without faith. And that was for me to break through the glory. See, some of us were like, well, I hadn't done very well. And I, I feel a lot of guilt while I'm sitting for some of the things that I didn't do and I should have done or whatever else. But how many of you know that it's not about guilt and shame? That's not productive at all. Yesterday ended last night. We can't do anything about yesterday. We can only do something about today and tomorrow. We're talking about the future, not the past. You got kids and grandkids and whatever coming along. It's never too late to do the right thing. And it's never wrong to do the right thing. Right now, I want you to hold that chain up to heaven. And Father, right now, those things that we that are heaven, some of them are holding us right now, they're holding up addiction. Some of them right now are holding up lust. Some of them are holding up, uh, some of them are holding up, uh, you know, poor management of health. And some are holding up a lot of anxiety and worry. Some of them are holding up people pleasing. Some of them are holding up, you know, a, a family that don't serve God and is not serious. Or they got religion, but they don't have a relationship with God. They've never been passionate about the things of the Lord. Some of them are holding up negativity and negativism. Some of them right now are holding up abuse that is going in their family generation after generation. Some are holding up unfaithfulness. Some are holding up right now a lack of good stewardship of money and finances. Some of them are holding up so many things. I, I couldn't even name them all. I know them because there's so many families like mine that is perfect and we're all dysfunctional at different levels. But God, we want something better for our kids and our grandkids and us. We want something better. And I'm asking you right now, through the power of Jesus Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, help us to break every chain. Say, God, help me break every chain. Come on, everybody. God, help me break every chain. Come on, everybody, loud. God, help me break every chain. Hold it up. God, help me break every chain. Come on, break God, break every chain. Break every chain. Come on, lift it up right now. Break every chain. Thank you guys for watching with us. We hope you heard from God today. Remember, don't forget to scan the QR code so that we can give you your free gift. And again, don't forget to text 411 to stay up to date on all that's happening at Life Springs Church. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for this wonderful service today, for your presence with us. We pray that everyone watching this got something from the service that they felt your presence and that they will leave here feeling you with them and knowing of your love for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you guys for watching. We'll see you next week.